So I was just, I was actually just talking to uh, Lisa about this just before we started. And I, you know, one thing I wanted to say to you, like, so I'm in Scandinavia. We are like, it wouldn't be uncommon to drink <laughs> during the day. Just saying like, so you were like, what time is it for you now? It is one o'clock. Oh, and that's. I know it's like right in the middle of my day. And I thought I would really love to have a cocktail with Ricky. <laughs> oh, we should, yeah, you should do that. But my day's not done yet. So we're, we're having water. We can, we can pretend it's gin. We can pre yeah. pretend it's gin. <laughs> Actually, you and me, I, I'm guessing we were at the same conference once where they served wine during lunch. Winefulness. I oh, and love they, and they served that. champagne for breakfast. That was incredible. In, uh, it was insane. We need more Seville. conferences like that. We need more conferences yeah. like that. Oh, and Parma and Parma uh, yes, in Italy. Yes, that was exactly <laughs> lots of wine and very hot. So, okay, welcome everybody. For those of you who don't know me, you probably know me since you are here. My name is Ricky. I'm I'm sending directly from my office in the dark. I'm wearing yoga pants, no makeup. I'm having a little hello. And uh, the concept of this is that I talk to awesome people about things that matter. And, uh, and Lisa Coyne, shall I say Mrs. President? <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Why don't you no tell pressure. people who you are? But I know you and I love you. Oh my and goodness. who are you? Um, well, I am, I live in Boston. I am a clinical psychologist. I have done many, I've played many different roles, I guess, as a clinical psychologist. I have been a tenured professor. I have run my own, I've started my own clinic, two clinics now. Um, and at present, I run the New England Center for OCD and Anxiety here in Boston with staff of about 12 people. And we use evidence-based um, treatments for children, adolescents, and adults, and families who struggle with OCD, anxiety, um, and body-focused repetitive behaviors, trauma. And I really love what I do. Um, I am very, one of the things that's really important to me in my life is being of service. It's a value. And so I do a number of service roles. Among them, I'm the president of the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science, um, which is an honor. It's probably the biggest honor I've ever in my life. Um, and I do quite a lot of work for the International OCD Foundation. Um, some of the things that I do for them are we are trying to disseminate evidence-based um, treatments to clinicians who either are belong to marginalized or underserved groups or who are serving those groups. So we do a lot of pro bono things, a lot of free um, stuff. And I have two kids. Um, one is in college, she's 21. Her name is Josie, she's fabulous. And I have a son, Rory, who's 15, soon to be 16, oh my goodness. And my husband's name is John. He works for Pfizer and you guys can thank him for working so hard on the vaccines. He indirectly helped with all of that. So sorry about the side effects if you had them, but do get the shot if you can. <laughs> um, and I have three dogs and they are, you would think they would be better behaved given my background in behavior analysis, but they're not. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go <laughs> one of the things Lisa so so I you know I've known you for a long time and and so sometimes I think like I can you know sometimes you can keep falling in love with people and one of the places where I saw you where you did something outstanding uh, I've seen you in many places but you were I think we were in Montreal at a conference and the room was I was like thousands of people that was Utterly terrifying, but go on. <laughs> yes, I get, I, and let's talk about that because you know oh I think you were, you you might have been scared, but what I love is about that we were at a conference and there was thousands of people and you were on stage and I do not remember what you were talking about, well some of it, <laughs> but I I'm remember, glad that it made such an effect. no, but because because I was you know I was presenting at the same conference so I was very scared. But I remember that you ended the talk in front of thousands of people and professors and all of that saying, save your fucks <laughs> for the things that 
set your soul on fire. So like you were talking about giving a fuck and then you were saying, save your fucks for the things that let, sets your soul on fire, something like that. And I was just yeah, like- Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm. All right, so let's talk about- I, And I love, and I want to say that was literally the most important part of that. <laughs> so uh, yes, that, so uh, the, yes. You got it. And I, yes, I was terrified. I was hearing like a mad person. And I think oh. I remember that one of the pe- things you were talking about uh, was your own fear. So why don't you- <laughs> I'm just going to put you on the spot. Deep here. dive. Deep yeah, dive. Dive just, right in. Let's just talk about your fear. Oh, Ricky. I'm <sighs> so glad this is you I'm talking to. I just yes. think you're such a rock star. And I just want to say you are such a credit to the field. Like you're so amazing. And I just want to say you. that. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, so what should we talk, talk about, about with my should... fear? Yeah. So I remember that. In that specific talk, you're actually talking about a journey that you did. Uh, uh, Correct. Yeah. 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 Where you were exposed to your own fear and you made an important, I think, bridge between that and the things that we do as that are, I know yeah. not, might not everybody be therapists here, but working with people who are, um, who, who knows fear. And I just yeah. thought it was so beautiful when you spoke about your own fear. So sure. would I'm you happy tell us about that? that? Story. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, my daughter's 21 now, but when she was a senior in high school and in the US, that means 18 secondary school, the last year of secondary school, um, I wanted to give her a gift. I wanted her to give her an experience where she could learn that you could do anything if you put your mind to it. And so I, we have a very good friend, a mutual friend, and Ricky has been on these trips too <laughs> with her mom, who I heard all about. <laughs> we should talk about the bus ride. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so we have a friend, a mutual friend, Louise Hayes, who runs a trekking company in Nepal. And she had just listed her um, you know, trekking calendar and they were going to go to Everest Base Camp in Nepal. Now, when I was little, I was what you would call back then a tomboy. I was much more like a boy than a girl. I played in the woods. I played with all boys. I rode dirt bikes. I played commando. You know, it was just very, that was who I was. And I used to read about Everest all the time. It was so fascinating to me. And I thought, my God, that would be amazing. But I'm, I don't even know if I can do this. And I thought, oh, what if I took Josie? And so I asked her if she wanted to go and she said, yes. And she had to bend over backwards to figure out how to do this. She had to talk to her teachers and take time off her senior year. And it was really hard, right? So she had to face some things that were hard, but she did it. Getting ready was hard. This, this is all about choosing and valuing because all of the things we had to do to work up to this were very hard, lots of fitness work and stuff, but we made it, we got there and we were very excited. And <laughs> you would think I'm like somewhat of an intelligent person having a doctorate, but <laughs> I did not think of this. I actually have a massive fear of heights. <laughs> And somehow it didn't occur to me that that could somehow come into play. Trekking in the Himalayas, but lo and behold, it did. And my fear is pretty, pretty big. Like, you know, if I can't, I freeze, you know, have, have you ever had the freeze experience where like you literally can't move? Yes. I that, have, yeah, yeah. that is, that happens to me. I can't move to the edges of, of things that are high up. And I thought, well, crap, this is, this is inconvenient. <laughs> so what are we going to do about this? And I thought, well, I'm an exposure therapist. This is what I teach people. So I can do this. And so up the mountain I went. I thought I was doing a good job at this. And what I noticed was that no matter how many miles I walked, it wasn't getting any easier. I wasn't experiencing any sense of mastery or self-efficacy. I just always felt the same level of being scared. And I realized that I was doing what I teach. When we teach exposure, exposure and response prevention and exposure-based treatment, we don't assume people know how to actually do that. Okay. We teach them how to do it. Right. And that is a longer conversation. We can talk about that too, but 
I realized that what I was doing was not doing exposure well because I was protecting myself from feeling the anxiety by white knuckling, right? And what that means is kind of approaching something, but without any willingness to actually feel afraid. And I thought, well, crap. So I've got to actually think about like, well, what do I need to do different in order to do this well? And I realized there were certain things I was doing to protect myself. One was going really fast over the narrow parts. Two was I was focusing my attention only on the ground, right where my next footfall would go. That's it. I wasn't seeing anything. The only thing I was looking at was this maybe, you know, small patch of earth right in front of me. Um, and I wasn't letting anyone know that I needed help. So those were three things. And I thought, okay, so I know what I need to do. So the first thing I did was I slowed down and then I would even stop because that felt scary. It felt somehow that gravity would just, someone would turn the gravity button off and I would just fly off into the, <laughs> into the sky and that was terrifying. So I would stop, which was scary. And then I thought about where am I, where's my attention, you know? And I thought about what do I want this trip to be about? Like, do I want to just remember the small square I'm looking at in front of my feet? Or do I want to like be in the mountains? I'm, I'm maybe never, ever, ever going to come back here again, right? And I wanted to see them. I brought a camera um, and I was, so I had to look. I had to open my eyes and I had to look and I had to look over the edge and I had to spend time being terrified and also taking in all of this beauty that was just absolutely breathtaking in every way, right? And so I did those things. And then finally, I needed to learn to ask for help, which I think for women, especially if you are in any sort of leadership role or you're trying to be in a leadership role, is very hard, you know? Or if you have a trauma history, like one in four of us do in the US, and you've been disappointed and you're asking for help in the past, it's not come when you've most needed it, that's so hard, right? But I, I, you have to learn to ask for help. And so I would ask our guides, you know, if it was a really scary spot, I would swallow my pride and say, will you hold my hand? And they did. And it was great. So, so this got me all the way up. Whoa. Until the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just do a little, whoa. Asking yeah. somebody to hold your hand is just so difficult. Yeah. So hard. And then, so it got me all the way up until like the very last stop before the final push to base camp. And by the time I got there, despite all of the training I had done, I felt like my, I felt like I might actually have a heart attack yeah. or like throw a clot. And, you know, you, you've been there, Ricky, you know, yeah. there are danger signs all over about cerebral edema and all of this stuff. And I was and it so, literally is hard to like, there's no, you, it's hard to breathe. It, yeah. It's hard to breathe. Steps are hard. You have yeah. to relearn how to walk and breathe. That's the best yeah. way I could describe it. So we sat down for this last meal before the final push. And I was thinking, I really want to do this. And I really think I'm going to die. Like I really thought I would actually, if I did any more, I would actually just maybe have a heart attack. And I was dreading the that meal ending because I knew at the end of it, everybody would get up and I was not going to get up. And so it happened, everybody started to get up and I kind of just sat there. <laughs> this is the hard part to talk about. And they noticed I did not get up. And I told them I didn't think I could do it. And I looked at Josie and she started to tear up. And everybody was really gentle and they really made it clear they wanted me to go, but they also would respect my decision to not. But then Louise showed up and she brought with her um, 
Jang Bu, who was one of our guides. And he was this lovely young man who I think he had cerebral palsy and he was a brilliant trekker. And she said, you know what? Why don't we do this? Why don't you just walk for 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, Jang Bu's gonna stay with you the whole time and the moment you wanna turn around, he'll take you. And I was like, okay, 10 minutes. And three hours later, we made it. So that was the scariest part, was that. And Lisa, when you're telling this, what are you noticing? Uh, just, actually, the first word that pops into my mind is beauty. Yeah. You know, it's just the beauty of the experience. And it's the same thing that I feel when I'm working with, with young people who are facing their fears. You know, when you really face something that you genuinely think is just this abject terror and you see them to it and, and you really think you can't. So that is what I bring to the work that I try to bring to the work that I try to teach young clinicians. Like we are capable of so much more, so much more than our minds think we are. We really, really are. And I would say that that is probably the most profound thing I learned on that track. You know, because you can know that for other people and you can believe that for other people and also not believe it for yourself. Yeah. And that's what I learned. So that was kind of neat. I, I, I just want to thank you for sharing with all of us. It's very <laughs> moving. And, 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 you know, again, one of the reasons why I love to, to talk to you and listen to you is because you do have a way of uh, being so incredibly brave and authentic. Um, I don't and feel I, that way all the time. <laughs> I keep well, it. I think it kind of comes with the, you know, that yeah. part of the authenticity that you don't, we don't feel like that all of the time. Yeah. And I just love these, like you said that there were three things that was important. One thing was kind of slowing down and, yeah. and, and being in the scary shit, if you will. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Another thing is that was kind of, you know, broadening your attention and, and, you know, behavioral repertoire so that you notice more than the, yes. the you, you know, dirty uh, boots. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then asking for help. Like those are, for, for me that, you know, those are just profound life lessons. So they just really out were. of curiosity, I just want to uh, pay attention to the chat here. You can either chat with us or you can come on. And so I would be, um, I would be interested in like the people who are joining us here, if you would be willing to write, I will, and I will not call out your name, uh, and you know, <laughs> so, but if you would be willing to put in the chat, uh, what, what are you afraid of, so that we get a sense of what is it that we're afraid of in here. Mm. I had so while while we're waiting for people to write uh, their answers, I had a somewhat you know you know of that, uh, but I you know it I, it has occurred to me that fear is not a natural part of my repertoire. Like I really will, no, I will do sad and I will do uh, you know I can do fear of failure, but like actual like it's never I've never had that you know, a lot in my life, it's, I can more like, I can get stressed, I could get so uh, sad, uh, etc. But when I was in Nepal, I was like, I was having fear in a way that is just like, so I, I really, your experience resonates with me. I was mm. sure, like I was lit, I was sure I was not coming home to my kid. Like I was, this is the end. And I just, you know, you're, I, I'm not encouraging everybody to go, well, you should go to Nepal with Louise Hayes, but, you know. Yeah, you should. <laughs> I think, I think, Highly recommend. So if you want, like, to see your exposure, you, you can oh, do yeah. that. And so it's much more than that. I can't wait to go back. <laughs> but, of course, that was an extreme experience. But I'm that's just going to say here, so there are people who are afraid of people, afraid of heights, afraid of success not being good enough, afraid of love, other mm -hmm. people's opinions and being true to myself, being left, putting myself out there, hurting the people I care about, 
one more is afraid of heights, not being good enough, being judged, not being good enough. Uh, Amy says, well, I'm calling you out, Amy, but <laughs> it isn't for me either, Ricky. Uh, and I'm thinking, I, I think you're might referring to what I just said about fear and your repertoire. Expectations from others and of spiders, not being good enough, relationships failure and not good enough, fear of mm. trying new food, not being strong enough, too old, not living up to the expectations, afraid of being hurt, not being good enough. We've had that so much, not being good enough, right? No longer living yeah. to potential, afraid of commitment, fear of social settings where I don't know people around, hurting people I love, becoming sick so I can't take care of myself, and no anxiety, but not feel like you described. Yeah. I to feel scared of not caring yeah. for my family, not being able to take care of my family. Yeah. Here's one to be rejected when I, when I date. I'm afraid of judgment, being not mm. enough. Uh, so they're, it, they just keep coming in. Um, so like, it, it sounds like fear is kind of, you know, one of the thing that, one of the things that connects us, isn't it? Yeah. A lot of similar fear too. And so a lot of similar fear too. Yeah. And so, so you manage to, and I just love, you know, and again, it might sound, cause not everybody knows Louise, but you know, Louise has a certain way of coming to you gently and saying why don't you try this for 10 minutes and I think there is something in that approach that is just beautiful Very encouraging important. you you can you can choose if you do and you can choose if you don't how are you that's then, incredibly important that's so the important. choice piece the choice piece yeah. how are you using this in your work Lisa because I do know that you are a world famous badass mm -hmm. when it comes to working <laughs> with young young people and um you know and especially OCD right you know what? I don't even think, I don't think of myself like that at all. But what I do think honestly is that I'm really good at listening. I'm yeah. really good at like really, I don't know, just really trying to take in the magnificent person in front of me, you know, yeah. that's, and, and to really pay attention and also to let that person be my teacher. Oh, I love that. What does that it's mean? It's really important. What it means is that, you know, we're so accustomed to, I mean, maybe not this group, but I think that when we think about mental health issues and issues of, you know, disorder, we think of that as weakness. And actually what I see is incredible strength and resilience. It's just buried in there. And my job is to hold a space so that that young person can find their strengths because they're there and to trust that. And that's, that's really central to no matter what the approach is that I'm using, it's having that deep trust of this person in front of me. Um, they're exquisite and, and really just appreciating them as a whole person. Um, I think that that's, that's really the most powerful thing. And then once you do that and you hold that space, I think the answers for how to help guide them arise. You don't come into the room with them. You might have a skill set that you know really well, and I'm sure we all do, but how and when to use that is 100% something that arises just from being with this person, the process of the work that you're doing. Um, and I think that that part is hard to teach. And that's one of the things that is important to me when I do my trainings, like, you know, it's just, it's so important, you know, that that's the central piece. If you don't have that piece, you just have a bag of techniques. You know, I could have, you know, a bag of, the best tools in the world. And if I have no idea how to use them or when, what does it matter? What does it matter? You know? It so resonates between me and I love what you're saying about really listening and holding space and seeing that this, per like the people that we work with as capable. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just going to ask the, the, the people here who are with us again. So you thank you all for sharing all of these like fears mm. that you're having. Would you be willing then to share with us too in the chat? So what do you guys do? Like when fear shows up, what does avoidance look like? 
how does it look such like a great for question. you, Lisa? Well, how does avoidance look like when, when fear shows up for you? So I am noticing right this moment that I get, I'm shaking. Actually, you guys can't see this, but I'm actually quivering a little bit because this is, there's a part of this that feels very, it's, it's, I find being vulnerable, very scary. Yeah. And that doesn't change. That's just a fellow traveler. Um, I get headaches, right? So these are consequences of avoidance. So that's one of my cues that I am avoiding something. And that's, if I'm mindful, it's also a cue to like, I don't have to hold myself so tightly and bunched up. I can actually <sighs> relax, you know? So that's one thing, even, even if I'm afraid, I can relax my muscles physically is what I mean. Um, so you would have uh, like kind of, so, like not maybe, they might not be subtle, but you would kind of, you know, you said that white knuckle, I think it's a yeah, beautiful that's term, it. like you would be tense, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's that. Yeah. Um, Other things that would be my go-to, like as a clinician, it would be jumping into sort of problem solving. Oh yeah. Instead of really staying with my person that I'm working with, um, that would be one. Feeling defensive, being defensive, not with a client necessarily, but like in you know everyday life, I would say that's one. Um, you know, and I find there's great value. And maybe this is something that the kids that I work with have taught me actually. If there's great value in just really paying attention to those moments in your life where you're feeling like you need to defend yourself from something. Yeah. And if it's not an actual danger, really leaning in and letting yourself hang out in that space, being open to it being open to learn, keeping a beginner's mind is really important to me too, always. Cause like, I think the moment you think you're an expert at something, you've stopped learning. I never want to stop learning ever, ever. There's so much to the world. There's so much we don't know, so much I don't know, you know? So, so I love what you're saying about leaning in and, and just, you know, exploring what is there. Oh, I love that. We have mm. here getting defensive, skin picking, sweating, muscle tensions, mm -hmm. uh, le explain or leave the situation, yeah. walk, 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 uh, disconnection from other people, quiet, uh, intellectualizing, not being genuine, please yeah. say no, oh, there are so many. Um, doing everything else except the important thing. Yeah, get angry, yes. rest, run away. Speed talking. Oh, I know that. I sometimes suffer. From, <laughs> I was thinking about that <laughs> from verbal diarrhea. Like I was. Like, <laughs> You're so funny. Thinking. Uh, talk down to myself. Stay home. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, people I just love. Not being present. Can't concentrate. Uh, postponing. Uh, oh my God. Thousands of thoughts. Fighting. Consumed with my thoughts and not being present. So. Again, thank you guys for sharing with us. Yeah. Uh, I feel, you know, I, I love what you were saying before, Lisa, that, that it's very beautiful when people share. And mm -hmm. I think that there's a, you know, opportunity for connection with other people when we show ourselves vulnerable and human mm -hmm. and authentic. I, I love that. And so thank you all for sharing this with us. So Lisa, and as you're saying that, Ricky, like one of the things that's popping into my mind is I think this is definitely true for me. And I wonder if it's true for some of our, our folks who are listening is like hiding those pieces of ourselves that we find unacceptable. Yes. That our minds tell us are not okay. That are not enough. That are shameful. Yes. That are damaged. That are yes. broken. Yes. Yeah. So hiding that. Hmm. And it's, a, you know, it, it can be very vulnerable to show the world, right? It can be very vulnerable. Yeah. So knowing that, well, I don't know, but um, some, of, some of the people who are here, I think many of the people here are working like our professionals, maybe not everybody. And, uh, but I think that 
what you said before, despite the fact that we're trained in this, we kind of forget our skills. <laughs> 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 you know, it's, it's, yes. much easier. <laughs> it's, it's easier to tell others what they should do and of you know, course. Be, a, be a coach or a guide or a therapist. Yeah. So, like if we, we, if we came to you, Lisa, mm. uh, no pressure, but if, if this group came to you and said, I, you know, I, I, I'm really fright, afraid now. And then this, all of the things that, that people just shared with us, um, what would you advise be? if you're afraid what would you tell us like people will say i'm afraid of not being good enough i'm afraid of love i'm afraid of being rejected what will you tell us i would tell you that we don't get scared of those things that are not really really important to us so what i would say is that when you feel anything that's a strong emotion but fear especially it means there's something you care about really, really deeply inside of it. There's something powerful there. And the thing is, if we spend all of our time trying not to be afraid, you're going to miss that thing. You're going to miss that really important thing that might be in there. And, you know, a good thing to do is to remember that fear is not an, an anxiety they won't hurt us. Our bodies were built to feel these things. There's no amount of fear that's too much that will break you. There's no amount of, of, of anxiety that will you know, damage you in any way. We are made to feel these things, right? And they are information for us. And so if we avoid it, we're not gonna know what it is that information might be, you know? And it's, it's something that often shows up on this, the road to the stuff that we really care about. So that's what I would say is befriend it, allow it. You don't have to like it. You don't have to love it. Most of us don't, I don't, you know? But here's the thing, like, you know, I've had social anxiety for like so many millions of years at this stage. And I used to not talk. I used to not give talks. I used to not present at all because it was just, I'd have panic attacks, period, right? And what I learned is that that put me, the avoidance created a cage. I created a cage for myself where I couldn't actually do the things that I cared most deeply about. And so I chose to start saying yes. And what happened was, you know, years later, I give talks all the time and sometimes I'm anxious and that doesn't matter. <laughs> it's just, it's not that I'm not anxious. A lot of times I'm not anxious and that's really lovely, but that doesn't matter either. What matters is, am I choosing to do something that matters to me, right? Like that I care about. And if I care about teaching, if I care about being of service, right? And lately, the older I get, because I've been here for over half a century now, not to date myself. And I know I don't look at right, right, no, right. No, you do not. <laughs> anyway, um, you start to really think about like, wow, I really need to, I mean, I have less time. How do I really distill those things that are really the most important to me? And to me, it's about dissemination right, of, of these things. It's about teaching. It's about not just this person in front of me, but how can I teach clinicians? How can I, right? Another thing that's a, a huge thing is I am so privileged. I am so, I'm white. I am middle class. I, you know, I, 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 I am cisgender. My God, what gifts, right? Well, I want to use them. I want to use them to amplify for those people who were denied those gifts and who didn't deserve that. And so that's the other thing that's really important is how can I use this, what I've been given to right these disparities and these wrongs? How do I do that? And so I'm my, that's where my mind is. And I'm always afraid of doing it wrong and saying the wrong thing and pissing people off and all of that. And 
that's just part of it. That's part of the process. Like, how do I keep moving forward? Even if that happens, even if I make enemies, even if I fail and people think I'm stupid and an idiot and did it all wrong. If that's what it takes to pave the way for someone else, yes, I say yes. And that's what I mean. It's like when you start leaning into the things that are hard and those things that you're scared of, you really learn, you can, you can generalize that practice to anything that's hard. And that's the, the incredible resilience you see in these kids that we work with with anxiety and OCD is they've been given this horrific burden that also could be if they choose, right? To learn from it, an incredible gift. You know, not that we'd wish it on anyone because that pisses them off to say that, especially when they're struggling, right? Truth be told. But we can either struggle with it or we can say, you know what, in this wreckage, where are the jewels? What can I pull from this that's of value? And that's, that's important to me, choosing to live my life in that way. You know, I, I, I think I speak for everybody when I say like, this is why you are such a great inspiration to so many of us, Lisa. This is just, whoa, it really, you touched my heart in so many ways. That I means a lot. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about uh, that moment when you asked for help. I'm just before before I ask that, 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 the question. I hate because, asking for help. Yes, I'm just going to go out into gallery mode. So I'm now looking at everybody, people who are drinking, knitting, playing with babies, and you know everybody. I love I'm just that. Bring ask, more babies. Yes, I'm just going to ask the crowd here. And so many of you, many of us are helpers, and by, by all means, you don't have to be a helper to be in yeah. this bar with us. How like can we just can we get a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Like are we are we good? Are you good? Good. I don't well are you are you asking for help a lot? Like it can thumbs up or thumbs down. Like how skilled that we are Who we does at asking for help. <laughs> I can is, relate. Everyone's like, yeah. Lena is someone Amy the is, first one. Amy's, yeah, yeah, baby. Good for Maria. you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, baby. So some of some are. But most of us aren't. So what was that like for you? Because, you know, that you were you were not in Nepal when you were three. Like this was just no. like it was a few years ago. What was that like for you? Mrs. President, Dr. Coyne. <laughs> right? Like All exposure, these names exposure that like expert. It's so funny. I hear those and I'm like, who are you talking about? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. It's a hot mess. What are you talking about? <laughs> so like like you are, like I <laughs> you're spending your days teaching people about exposure and there you're finding yourself on a mountain unable to move. Yeah. <laughs> how, so how like how does one do that? It's hard. Yeah. Um, and I think the first thing is to notice the stories we have about asking for help. And I, I want to answer the question directly because I don't want to talk about what to do and teach it. I want to actually like put myself back in that position. And like, I, I'll tell you, actually, can I tell you a story of a more recent time I asked for help? Yes. Okay. So I have a bad reputation. That's true. And the reputation is, I don't know if this is, I don't know if you guys know this, but it's actually, I think, accurate that I do, I take on a lot of things with the best of intentions and then I drop balls and I am constantly or have been constantly berating myself for why can't I do things as well as other people? Like, why am I dropping balls? What is happening here? Right? And I had a good friend So I want to tell you this story because it might be useful to you. Okay. Even though it's a little hard. <laughs> I have a good friend, Evelyn Gould, who works with me and she's sort of a partner in our business and she helps um, train clinicians with me. And she said, you know what? 
you should write, you should do a task analysis. You should write down all of the things that you have to do during your week and how much time it takes you to do them. And I thought, okay, I'll do that. So I did. And I wrote all of them down in an Excel spreadsheet, all the things I should do. And I wrote down the time it would take to actually do all of the things. And guess how many hours of the week it would have taken? I would love to hear what you guys think. Just guess, you could guesstimate. A lot. Guess, 60, 200, 100, 60, 80. It was very close. <laughs> it was 106.5 hours. Whoa. And I want you to think about the math there. How many hours would you have to work each day? Yeah. How much sleep? And I, I saw that number. <laughs> I did the sum on the Excel file and I had a panic attack. Oh. And I thought, I am going to actually kill myself if I don't figure out what is this about? Why is this? And I noticed that when I'm not working so hard, I was experiencing, I felt not just anxious, but like this feeling of not being safe. To me, it felt like I'm not safe. I can't keep my family safe unless I do all of this. And I thought, okay, I don't get this. What is this? And I was like, it is time to ask for help. And I did. And I started seeing a therapist, which was really a very good thing. Wow. I'm so proud of you for doing that. Thanks, I'm Ricky. So, I'm so grateful that you shared this with us. It's like, you know, great inspiration, really. Well, I, the, the reason it's important for me, I think, to say this is that I think it is really hard for women to, you know, based on history, but based on culture, to not think that we have to do more and better yeah. all the time. And to that, if we feel, we often feel like to ask for help means we're vulnerable. And we have to do that. We have to take care of ourselves. And we have to start looking at these stories that we have culturally that keep us down, right? And I didn't realize how deep in the hole I was, you know, but thank goodness I have good friends that look out for me. And one of the things that I, Though if I can share a story, so, uh, you know, some of my, I see that some of my trainees are here, so you might have heard this, but I, uh, and I don't know if you heard this, Lisa, but when I was in Nepal, um, I, and as many of you know by now, I brought my mom with me, and she was 71 about that time, so she's a tough old lady. <laughs> <laughs> I heard all about your mom. <laughs> yes. She's, uh, yeah, she's there. She's, yeah, we could do a week of podcasting just about my mom. And there, we came to this place where, like, later we would talk about it as the wall. Like, it was literally, it was so steep. And there was, we were like, how, how, how are we going to get up here? And my mom, uh, I was kind of in problem solving, like, how, how do I do this? And my mom, she was sure she couldn't do it. And she absolutely lost it, like mm -hmm. just lost it. And I haven't seen that. Like, so I was like, so uh, affected by this. Like I saw my mom being so scared, being so overwhelmed, oh. saying like, I, I, I know what you're saying, but there's no way I can get up there. And the guides came to her and they said, oh, you know, can we carry your back? Can we hold your hand? And sh her response was, oh, no, 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 no. I packed these bags myself. I chose, you know, I, I, I booked this trip myself. I chose to come here. I don't want to be a burden. And the guides, said, and you know these people, said I do. something in the line of, if you don't get up, we don't get up. And so she uh, allowed herself to be carried. And 
in this moment, the reason why I'm so, you know, first of all, I'm proud of her. But it also occurred to me that in my entire life, I was told it's okay to ask for help, but it was never shown to me. Like nobody should, like I have parents who've never asked, like they would ask, you know, pass me the salt maybe, but they would never ask for help inside of an emotional struggle. And they would say to me, it's okay to do that, but I have not, I, I have not been taught that. And so I remember like sob, snot crying, you know, at that mountain, deciding, choosing, I will, I will start asking for help. And I will start talking about asking for help. And my God, I will teach my children to do this. Because I've been saying this, I haven't shown right. them. And so I've been using this metaphor many, many times about, you know, uh, when your bag is too heavy and then you allow yourself to be carried and that there's more carriers. And then one year later, and I have permission to, to tell you guys this, my son, he was 16 and he was suffering from heartbreak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so his little heart was broken and he did not have the words. Like he did not have, you know, uh, the vocabulary to talk to me about it. But I remember he came to me in the middle of the night. And so he'd been, uh, obviously been listening to me telling this story again and again. He came to me in the middle of the night and he woke me up and he said, mom, I think I'm at my mountain Aww. and I, there's no way. I don't know how to get up. Will you help me carry and will you hold my hand? And so, you know, it, it breaks my heart. And I think this is so profound to not just tell people to ask to for it. help but to do it yourself and to gift like i think it's you know the more i've digging into this i've uh, been digging into this i think it's a gift like you're giving people a gift when you're asking them <laughs> to help you right mm, yeah so you know for me, that's a beautiful metaphor. And the people around me who know this, they will now come and talk about standing at one's mount mountain with a bag that's way too heavy and with an experience of there's no way I can do this. And then remembering if you don't get up, we don't get we up. We don't get up. Yeah. It's really important. Yeah. I love that so much. Yeah. I love that. So we're having all these hearts and <laughs> powerful. <laughs> yes. Yes. We're crying. That's yeah. okay. That's okay. <laughs> so, and so we're coming. Well, we're not at the end yet. Uh, oh, fuck. That hits me so hard. I love that. Too. I love that. <laughs> exactly. So like, uh, I was wondering, so do you remember I started this by saying, I just remember you on stage because I'd seen you actually mostly in social contexts uh, yeah. then. And you got on stage in front of thousands of people. You were talking about fear and OCD. I know, I know what you were talking about, but the, the thing that struck me was by the end where you were saying, save your fox for yeah. the things that set your soul on fire. Could you talk a little so it's so could you tell people like could you could you could you do it again Lisa <laughs> do it for this oh my crowd. goodness all right so oh my gosh when I was in eighth grade I was 14 and I had a science teacher named Mrs. Gleason and Mrs. Gleason had this fabulous assignment for us where we were learning about the night sky and we were learning about stars and planets and things. And her, the assignment was we had to go outside at different times on different nights and draw the sky. And I still remember one night, maybe it was many nights, but I, in my mind, it's just this one where I'm in the backyard and there's, it's silent and there's just a little bit of wind in the branches of the trees and the snow is glowing this blue lavender color. And I was looking up at the stars and I just 
had this just deep sense of awe and peace in the universe. And it was just really amazing. And so what I had been talking about in that talk that Ricky's talk mentioned is, you know, how do we, how do we find our way back to a sense of awe, right? Because there's a sense of fear that is constraining, right? That sends us running. And there's another sense of fear that leads us to awe. And I wanted to talk about that because I think that those are flip sides of the same coin, right? And so the, th the statement, you know, things that set your soul on fire. When I went to college, I went to um, a Jesuit institution and the Jesuits are, I'm not religious, um, but I did grow up Catholic and the Jesuits are a specific, I guess, branch of the priesthood in, in Catholicism. And their values are literally skeptical thinking and science and service. And it was funny because when I was thinking about what to say in that talk, I, I kept coming across that idea that those, and I realized those are, those are the things that are like at the core of me. Like those are the things that are so important to me, like that we are clear thinking in our science and that we use that service for good, right? Where it matters. And this led me to think about CBS, right? Contextual behavioral science and the potential of our science to change the world, right? That we are mindful in how we live. We are mindful in how we do things such that we leave this place better than we found it instead of depleted, instead of struggling and suffering with the climate changing and with you know, our depletion of resources, our overconsumption, our disparities in how we care for each other, right? Where, you know, we can write people off as other when it suits us. I'm not okay with that. And so that's what I wanted to talk about in that talk was how do we do that? And so I, we have only so many fucks we get in our life, right? And there's a lot of stuff. Sometimes we give too many about the wrong things, you know, and this is, I don't know if this is an American saying or not, right? But, you know, there's such bullshit that we can let go that just doesn't matter. Like what people think of us, who gives a fuck? Really? Who fucking cares? Right? But what does matter, right? If you only have so many breaths, so many years, right? So many moments, how do you want to use them? Don't waste your time. Do stuff that's awe-inspiring, right? Do stuff that inspires others, right? Do inspire them about who they are, right? Even if you don't feel like you inspire yourself, that's okay. That comes along with it. None of us think we're all that, you know? But what does it matter? You know, if we are what we do, choose, right? Choose how to act wisely. Choose to be consistent, with those things that matter the most to you. And then turn around and see, how did it go? Like when I leave the planet, what I want, <laughs> is I want to know that people are safe. Yeah. And that there's a path of people in my wake that can say, yeah, she helped me and that they help others, right? That I help people and this place be better than when we found it. That's what I want. So, so save yeah. your fox. Save your fox. <laughs> things that set your soul on fire. Exactly. Oh. Exactly. And that's a, that's time. Who is it? St. Ignatius said that, I think, you know. Save, save your whatever for the things that's go out and set, um, go out and set the world on fire. Yeah. Was one of the things he wrote. And that's where the Jesuits, right? That's where I got that idea. 
there's so much gratitude coming in here into chat and I just want to go back to gallery view here and so I, I don't know what you're seeing right now Lisa but I just want you to you know look at the people who are joining us now and see if you can see like the love <laughs> Can Aww. you feel the love tonight? <laughs> and so just, yeah, people are sending hearts and everything. So just wanted to, you know, to you, you to actually see that. It's my people, pleasure to be here. People yeah. are here with us. And, uh, and I think I speak for all of us when I say that you really touch our, you know, you really touch our hearts. And uh, I know your work and I know that you can be, you know, um, very in lack of better words like very scientific and very correct and all of that like you have that you've written you know so much yeah yeah oh I have your literally I have your book uh I we should like we didn't prepare this but we should promote the shit out of this uh so you you co-wrote a book with uh with with Jen and fabulous Matt. Matt Boone and Jen Greg yeah, yeah. It's called Stop, Stop Avoiding Stuff. And I had the pleasure of reading it actually before it was um, even, you know, I think printed. And it's it's a book for, it's called Tw Stop Avoiding Stuff, 25 Micro Skills to Face Your Fears and Do It Anyway. And, you know, we should just tell people that this is here and this is for clients, right? So it's, yeah, it's just it's for you. Lovely, it's for yeah. everyone. It's, it's for everybody. It's so, for anybody. So it, yeah. So thank you for writing that. And, what I was going to say was that you can be very correct and scientific. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm using the right words. And there's <laughs> something about you, Lisa, uh, Dr. Mrs. President, that you're also, <laughs> but you're giving us all a very authentic, vulnerable, strong woman who asks for help and who's not afraid to say fuck. And it just- That like, is true. I am yes. not afraid to say fuck. <laughs> and, and, and so just know that you are very inspiring to me and I'm just I'm very very sure that people who are watching you this very moment are falling in love with you again or for the first time as I am doing all of the time Richie, so I just I wanted to you thank too. you <laughs> thank you for being for coming here and so for the rest of you the bar is closing. I'm going to ask Lisa just to hang in the bar so because we can, you know, mop the floors and, and you know, finish the drink. <laughs> and so to all of you who are with us right now or who are watching this afterwards, thank you so much for coming. And uh, you'll get an email from me with the replay uh, for, for this webinar sometime tomorrow. Thank you. We love you. And good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. So nice to see you all. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> oh, the hearts, the hearts, the hearts. <laughs> <laughs>